So hey y'all, how we doing? Good, all right, fine, sleepy, all right, wake up, hey man, look that part. So um, as you see, we've been transforming into Breaker Beach, and so we'll continue to transform and be beach ready. I don't know if that's a term, but VBS ready. And so uh, it, it's, it's amazing what they can create and everything, so I get excited as we see the work happening. So uh, we've been in the book of Acts uh, all year long, week by week by week by week. And last week, what we saw was um, King Herod, what he did was he killed James, the brother of John, for nothing. Threw Peter in prison and was hoping that it was Passover and all the people in town and he was hoping that he was going to gain some favor with the, the Jews who weren't Christians, that he was going to gain some favor with them uh, by making an example out of Peter. So he was going to put Peter on trial. And what we saw was Peter was inside a prison behind guards, was even sitting in his cell, chained on both sides, two guards. And a miracle happened. An angel came in the middle of the night and freed him. And he was able to, to the, the chain fell off and he went outside. And so... Uh, we ended up talking about um, John Mark's mother, uh, another Mary, uh, who Peter went to her house. And we finished up. What we saw was Herod started frantically searching for Peter the next morning and couldn't find him. And he killed all those guards who let him get free. And so today we're going to pick up kind of it's a it's a two part kind of a deal. If you look at the text today, it kind of resolves what happened with Herod. And then it starts off with uh, uh, Saul. Uh, and Barnabas going out on their first missionary journey. Uh, I call this message On Mission with God. On Mission with God. And I think there are some little nuggets, there are some lessons, there are some things for us to take away with, from what we're going to see here today. And so I'm excited uh, with it, and I'm going to ask you if you have your Bibles, your smart devices, if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 12, uh, starting at verse number 20. So Acts 12, starting at verse number 20. And we're going to uh, pick up there, and we're going to read into uh, verse number, uh, chapter 13, and we're going to finish around verse number 12. And I'm going to be reading today from the New Living Translation. Please feel free to follow along with whatever translation you have in front of you. We'll get to the same place. So Acts chapter 12, starting at verse number 20. Uh, when I was a kid at church, they said, if you have it, say amen. Look, if you can read it on the screen, say amen. <laughs> oh, there it is. All right, no problem. <laughs> But Acts chapter 12, starting at verse number 20, uh, New Living Translation, and it reads as follows. Now Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So they sent a delegation to make peace with him because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food. These delegates won the support of Blastus, Herod's personal assistant, and an appointment with Herod was granted. When they arrived, Herod put on his royal robes, sat on his throne, and made a speech to them. The people gave him a great ovation, shouting, it's the voice of God, not of a man. Instantly, an angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. So he was consumed with worms and died. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread and there were many new believers. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission to Jerusalem, they returned, taking John Mark with them. Okay, I'm going to go to chapter 13 with just a couple of little things just, just right here. John Mark's the nephew of Barnabas. We saw that last week, right? Uh, Mary was his mom, which means that Barnabas and Mary were brother and sister. All right. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> there's an interesting contrast that we see here. As Herod was trying to stop the spread of the word of God, he meets his demise. All right. But at the same time, the word starts to continue to flourish. There's this contrast there. We'll talk about it in a minute. We just wanted to point that out. Chapter 13, verse 1, very next part right here. It says, Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manan, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the man laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit 
They went down to the seaport of Seleucia, and they sailed for the island of Cyprus. There, in a town called Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. Afterwards, they traveled from town to town across the entire island until finally they reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him for what he visited him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elmias, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Saul, also known as Paul, and this will be the first place he referenced that, so if I start saying Paul, I'm okay now. Okay, just, just there you go. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. When the governor saw what happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. We're going to stop right there. Um, so, so first, we'll talk a little bit about Herod's death and then kind of go on to what happens in 13. Um, simply stated, Herod wasn't a nice guy, right? I think we talked about that last week. He did some terrible things. If you remember, I think we, we talked about it, but maybe you weren't here. Uh, this is the same Herod. His granddad was the one who went to kill all the children three and under when Jesus was born. Uh, in, in the Gospels, we see that Herod. That's his granddad. Uh, his sister was the one who uh, had John the Baptist beheaded. Right? She said, I want his head. Same family. You know, you might not want to go to their house. It might not go well, right? I'm just saying. These, they were a wild bunch, right? So, so this is the same family that this guy comes from. And again, we see really this painful death that he ends up facing, right? When he, when, there's something about him trying to take and accept the worship that comes that should only go to God where he really crossed the line, right? He really crossed the line and accepted the worship that only should have gone to God, and he, he dies this, this terrible death with worms eating him from the inside out. Like, I don't even want to think about that. That's just bad. All right. And it's a reminder for us that pride is a terrible thing. Whew. Pride is a, is a terrible thing. And I think the other point for us to remember is that often, especially as we see people or, or men or women, whatever, with power, to remember that from our standpoint, that our God has the ultimate power. It's funny that he seemed like, again, he, he's these independent regions of, of Tyre and Sidon, um, they're having to depend on them for food, and this guy gets to make a decision whether these people are going to eat or not, and it seems like he wields so much power, but in an instant, God could take it away. It reminds us to not be afraid of those who are in power, but to make sure that we fear or take seriously who God is. Amen? When we get to chapter 13, there's just one thing that there's not a, I don't have a bullet point for, but I just want to make abundantly clear here, all right? The Holy Spirit is what is, is who's directing the action here. The Holy Spirit is the one who's at work in chapter 13. And don't miss it because it's easy to say, oh, look what, look what Paul did. That's Paul. Look what Saul turned to Paul did. Look what Barnabas, look, look at all the action that's happening there. But don't miss the fact that it was the Holy Spirit at work guiding and directing them. I'm going to read the first four verses of chapter 13 one more time uh, just for the sake of emphasis because I want you to see it. So, so hear me and then watch. The Holy Spirit starts all the action. Um, so in verse 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, it says this. It says, Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria, there was Barnabas, Simeon called the black man, Lucius from Syria, uh, Manan, the childhood companion of King Herod, Antipas, and Saul. All right, so these guys are together. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, who said something? The Holy Spirit. They were just minding their business, praising God, worshiping, right? Fasting, worshiping God. And it was the Holy Spirit who started the action. The Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I've called them to do. So after more fasting and praying, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. 
And he made it clear, in case we weren't clear, verse 4 says, let me make sure you understand, so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by who? The Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia, and then they sailed for the island of Cyprus. They did not go out on their own. They did not go out on their own, nor did they have to go it alone. You might say, Pastor, why does that even matter? Uh, up here on your screen, this is why it matters. One, if you send yourself to complete a task, then you are dependent on you to complete it. On the other side, if you're sent by the Holy Spirit, then you're not depending on your own self-effort. That's pretty straightforward. That's, that's pretty clear. We're to live a life where we're dependent on the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. And, and, and so I have to ask, it's not even up on the screen or anything else, uh, but I just have to ask, when you look at where you are right now, are you the one who sent you here or is the Holy Spirit leading you? With what you're doing, with what's going on, are, are you the one that, that, that is sending you? Are you going because it's like, I feel like God's telling me to go. I feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me to go. Or is it all me? Because it's funny. It's easy to look at Herod and say, oh, man, this dude had a lot of pride, all this other stuff. He was trying to win favor with people, whatever it is. But, but we might have a little Herod in us. I might be going not because God told me, but because I said I'm going to show them. Oh, that part, right. Okay, Just, I, I'll keep moving because I, I don't like how y'all are looking at me right now, but okay. Um, when we get to verses 2 and 3 that we just read, uh, Barnabas and Saul are worshiping the Lord. They're fasting, right? They were spending time, uh, uh, they, they, they were doing those two things, and then they get a word from God as to their next assignment. Uh, it, it's just one of those things that we've seen before as we've gone through the book of Acts. If you remember, two weeks ago, I think it was, in Acts chapter 10, Peter was just up on the roof praying to God and got a word from God while he was just sitting there praying, right? He was just spending time with God and got a word from God, heard exactly what he was supposed to do. We see the same thing happening here with Barnabas and Saul. And so you know what I'm going to say, right? You already know what I'm going to say. Okay, I'm going to say it anyway. We should regularly be spending time with God. In fact, I would argue that we can expect God to make it clear what he wants us to do. He is not trying to keep it a secret. Also, if you look at especially what we see in this story here today. Prayer was central to them going to do what God told them to do. They were in the midst of worshiping. They were in the midst of praying, right? They were in the midst of, of, of spending time with God when they heard what they were supposed to do. But it's cool, instead of them just going right away, okay, we're going to go do this now, they said, wait, let's go ahead and pray before we go. We understand what we're supposed to go do. Okay, God, let's make sure we check back in with you. Let's pray before we go do it. And so you might have a big journey in front of you right now, right? Maybe he didn't call you to go to all these countries to do this, but, but for you, it's a task that's in front of you right now. And don't forget to pray and, and to continue to seek and hear from God, because what would be weird is if they heard from God and then went and never talked to God again, never listened for God to speak again. I wonder sometimes, do we experience certain failures because it's really a prayer failure? We forgot to consult with the one who sent us. We forgot to go back and check back in as we went. The point I'm trying to make here is simply this. Uh, the connection with God for them in both cases, you look at Peter, but you look at what we see here, it was a lifestyle. It wasn't only something that they did in case of emergencies. It was a lifestyle of spending time with God, of, of, of living these holy lives, of, of sharing the good news of Jesus with other people. It was a part of who they were. And then we get to verse number four where we see them actually leave and they go on Paul's first missionary journey. When we think about the journey, I want to give kind of two overarching pictures because, you know, as the book continues, we'll see more of this, right? Two things that I want you to think about here. Uh, uh, first is this. When you step out on God's word, there will be fruit as a sign of confirmation. You say, confirmation? Yeah, confirmation that you heard correctly. 
Confirmation that you heard correctly. Uh, okay, let, let, let's, let's do it on the other side. If you said, I believe this is what God told me to do, and you step out, and there's no fruit, then that wasn't it. When you go to do the thing that God told you to do, when you sense, I think this is what God's telling me to do, there should be fruit. Let me hear you say, Pastor. Okay, I caught you off guard. Let's try it again. Let, let, let's say, Pastor. There should be fruit. There should be fruit. If you want back up for that, go to John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, for my discipleship folks who go through it, it says that, that he's the vine and we're the branches, right? And, what, and the expectation is that there should be fruit, because what he says is if there's fruit, he prunes it so it produces more, right? So, so the whole thing is there should be fruit if we're doing the thing that God has called us to do, and I don't want us to miss that. Uh, but can I tell you something good? If there's not fruit and you stepped out on it, that is okay. What? <laughs> you say, why is that okay? I think that's okay because we can't be afraid of missing it that we never step out on what we think we're hearing. Even if you step out and say, man, I, that wasn't it. Okay, that wasn't God. Hopefully that helps us to hear God clear, clearly as we go forward. But sometimes we say, well, I'm not sure, so I'm going to sit here. I don't know, Pastor. I'm just going to wait on the Lord and the sweet by and by, whatever that is, you know, with my sweet tea and I'm sitting on the porch, whatever it is. Now, come on. We can't be afraid to miss it. We can't be afraid to step out because we're called to go. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples. Not sit, therefore, and make disciples. Not wait, therefore, and make disciples. Not if you build it, they will come. That's filled a dream discipleship. No, he says, go. <laughs> We're supposed to go. We're supposed to go. And, and can, I, can I help free somebody up today in this area? It is okay to say, uh, next, next slide there, Audrey. It is okay to say that it wasn't God, that it was me, and then to change course. Look, let's just say amen together. Amen. It is okay to say, you know what? I thought this was God. I had too much of that spicy sriracha sauce on those wings I had. That was, that was, that was a bad idea. That was, that was me. Because we can't be bound by, well, I told them I was going to do this. Yeah, but my allegiance is to God first. And if I realized this wasn't it, it's okay to say, you know what? I was wrong. I thought, I thought that was it. Nope, that's, that's not it. Uh -uh, that's it. You, uh, there, there's this line that says, um, uh, what was it, uh, uh, about uh, dead ends. Um, yeah, when you're driving down the street, there's a dead end, right? Yeah, it says that the best thing about dead ends is that it leads to a turnaround. <laughs> you get that? Because you think about it, if you're driving, there's a dead end, you have to turn around because you can't keep going, right? So it's okay to say, man, I tried this way and that's not it. Th that, that is okay. Again, we got to get rid of the pride. It's okay to say, man, I, I, I thought this was it, but there's no fruit. Look, I will be the first one to tell you, there are things that we used to do that we don't do anymore as a church. A amen. It's like, we tried this. Yeah, that wasn't too much fruit. Ryan, we had too much guac at the, at the Mexican place, man. That wasn't, that, that, wasn't, that, that wasn't a thing that produced fruit. Sometimes maybe it's not now. Maybe we try it again later, but right now that's not it. So why keep doing it? Again, we have to be okay if we don't. Uh, if we did not hear, because it gives us better hearing when it comes to God moving forward. Um, uh, I had a friend last week um, that, I, that I spoke about, uh, that I spoke to, uh, who about four years ago, this friend had to make some major uh, life-changing kind of decisions um, regarding work and some other things and, and like relocated, right, uh, several states away. And so now, four years later, the friend is facing some other um, decisions that are kind of going to take basically, uh, yeah, potentially moving across the country in a couple different locations or whatever, uh, depending on the choice that's going to be made. And I remember as we were talking this week, what the friend kept, kept harping on was all the quote unquote mistakes that they felt they made in hindsight. It was like, oh, man, if I knew this, I would have made this decision differently, da-da-da-da-da. But then what I kept pointing out was I was like, yeah, that may be true, but do you see when you made this decision how God's grace still covered you? Like, I know if you, knew, if you had more information, you would have made this choice, but, man, do you see how this part worked out anyway? 
And we have to be careful about our perspective of looking at only the negative part and not realizing God's goodness. And here's the thing. Sometimes we won't take that step. Sometimes we won't go because we're worried about, man, I want to make sure I make the right decision. But sometimes you don't have all the information, but you have to just go. You have to make the choice. You have to make the decision. And you can't freak out because of that. But here's the good news. God is so intimately aware of how we're going to choose. He's intimately aware of what we're going to decide. And you know what he's done? He's already planned ahead for what we're going to do anyway. So even if I make a mistake and have one of those uh, costly lessons, right, I'm still thankful that because of his grace, he's already planned ahead on the other side of that. So we can go forward confidently, even in spite of making a quote-unquote mistake. Amen. Amen. We we must remember that not only, again, is God aware of of which way we'll decide and choose, but he plans ahead and expects us to follow him as the Holy Spirit is going to lead us and help us to navigate the journey. We have to trust him fully. But I'll still say the, the, the main point here is as you go, remember to look for fruit as confirmation along the way. Fruit will give you confirmation that, hey, I'm going the right direction. Hey, I'm going the right place. Uh, uh, As a side note, you'll see this a lot in Scripture also. Just just one quick example, this ain't even in the notes. Uh, I was thinking about during our, uh, I think, Advent, where we looked at at Mary. She heard this word from the Lord that she was going to be with child. And she says, as a matter of fact, your cousin Elizabeth is already six months pregnant, the one who was way past birthing years or whatever. And she gets there and sees confirmation along the way, right? Uh, just, just, just one of those things. You, uh, you'll see that in Scripture. Uh, I want to go back to verse number 6 in chapter 13. Uh, verse number 6, chapter 13, verse 6. I'm going to read this part again for emphasis. So Barnabas and Saul, uh, Paul and, and Barnabas. I said Barnabas and Saul, man. There it is. Oh, that was right. Yeah, it was Barnabas and Saul. That's right. I got it right. Uh, so ch- verse number 6, look at what it says here. It says, afterwards, they traveled from town to town across the entire island until they reached uh, Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer or, or false prophet named Bar Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elmias, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Then he said, you son of the devil, I'm sorry, uh, Saul, also known for Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good. Will you never stop perverting the true ways of of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon, uh, upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. And we finished here again in verse number 12. Uh, when the governor saw what happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. As Paul and Barnabas go, they face opposition. Let, let me hear y'all say opposition. As they go, they faced opposition, right? We should notice, next point, we should notice that the enemy will likely send an attack to try to stop you from doing what God has told you to do. We should notice that the enemy will likely send an attack that's going to try to stop you from doing what God has told you to do. I feel like, did did you think it was going to be easy? (laughs) Right? More than likely, you'll see an attack that's going to come. But here's the thing. We shouldn't let that stop us. Instead, expect it to happen. Expect that there'll be opposition as you're doing the things that God has called you to do. In In this particular instance, it was a sorcerer, right, who was trying to stop them from doing what God told them to do. The sorcerer was really afraid that the governor was going to believe in Jesus and he was going to be out of a job, right? That was his perspective. He he thought his position was going to be eliminated. And I don't want to focus so much on the opposition, but more so how we respond to it. Paul looked dude in the eye, (laughs) right? And did not stop. Looked straight up, did not stop. He knew what he was called to do and got busy about doing it. But what about you? Have you allowed the opposition coming against you uh, to cause you to question or stop doing what you know God has told you to do? 
I'll ask that again. Have you allowed the opposition that's coming against you cause you to question or even stop doing what you know that God has told you to do? Can, can, can I be honest? There's been times where I was like, Paul, this is what I'm going to do, and, and da, 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 da. But there was other times where I was like, now see, God, these, these people are crazy. Like, are you sure you need me to do this? You know, make, make it plain, Lord. Like, I look at the road that's in front of me, and I, I'm like, I don't know. Like, God, are, are, are you sure? I think we got to be, uh, although it's, it's great, and we're supposed to be big, bad, and bold, but I've gone back and said, God, you sure? And I think we have to be honest about that here, right? There's times where you see or experience the opposition and want to quit. But we're called to fulfill our God-given purpose. We're called to do the very thing that God has called us to do. And here's the good news. When God calls us, he also equips us. And so if he's called you to do it, you got to expect that, okay, I'm going to be able to carry out the very thing that you've called me to do. So I can't let opposition, I can't let fear, I can't let doubt, and I can't let what it quote unquote looks like cause me to stop. They had every reason to quit. They had every reason to stop, but they didn't. So if we can see that on them, let me turn the mirror to you and say, you might have every reason to quit. You might have every reason to want to stop, except, man, I know this is what God told me to do. I know this is where God told me to be. I know this is what what God has for me, at least right now, and so I'm going to do the thing that God told me to do in the face of opposition, in the face of the challenge, in the face of difficulty, uh, uh, because, uh, here's the next point right here, we should notice that in spite of the enemy's attempt to stop them, it did not prevail. The governor believed. The governor believed. Look, don't forget that part, because we're stuck in the middle. You know, we're like, oh, man, but pastor, look in the middle, right? No, no, no. In spite of all of that, it worked. They fulfilled the thing that they were supposed to do. You know what I believe? You're going to do the same. You're going to do the very thing that God has called you to do. So don't quit. Don't cave in. um, And don't give up. Every time you go forward doing the thing that you feel God's told you to do, you have to remind yourself, remind yourself that in spite of the enemy's attempt to stop you, it won't prevail. That it won't keep you from doing what God has told you to do. I often think when we face attacks, often what happens is, uh, in reality, the enemy know, knows that he can't stop what God wants to do, really. Right? But what does he do? He tries to get us to stop ourselves. To stop from going to get us scared, to, get to, to, to have doubt, to say, man, I don't know if we can complete this. Whatever. He tries to get us to stop ourselves because he knows if we keep going, he can't stop what God's going to do. And so if this is your reminder, hey, reminder, hello, to keep going. He said, ah, oh, but Pastor, I'm facing this big challenge. I know, but keep going. He said, ah, oh, Pastor, but it, it seems so much bigger than my ability. It should be. Why? Because you're depending on God and the Holy Spirit to help you. It's not on you. It's not in your self-effort. And so, uh, what, what does it say? Uh, when we're weak, that's when he's strong. Yeah, don't, don't let him win. Don't be afraid to change uh, approaches, to change strategies if you need to, uh, because sometimes there's more than one way to complete a task, but at the end of the day, the outcome is what matters, right? And that he led you to it. My very last point is this. We must dedicate ourselves to use our time, money, and talents for God's work. But also, here's this thing, which might seem simple, but we have to ask God what he wants you to do in this season. And I put in parentheses, and in the next season, and in the next season, and in the next season. It almost should be a part of like that daily prayer. It's like, okay, oh God, I'm about to leave the house. Uh, um, wh- show me what you want me to do today. 
Holy Spirit, as I go, make it plain who I'm supposed to talk to, who I'm supposed to help, how can I do this? Even if I'm going to my job, show me how I can, I can represent you and be effective and, and use my best effort of what you've given, given me to be excellent today. Help me to not be so task-oriented that I miss uh, the task that you've given me, right? Help me to see the way that you see. Help me to be your hands and feet today. It seems simple, but I promise you, ask him and watch what he does. Watch how the Holy Spirit's like, hey, you see that person right there? They said they're okay, but they're not. Go talk to them. And you're like, yeah, but I needed to run to the CVS, and I needed to go and do this during like that. There'll be time for that. Be available to be used and to be impactful. Because I know sometimes when we look at this, you're like, oh, my God, these two guys went to the city. They started at the synagogues, and they went all around this city from one side to the other and did this great work. I'm just going to Publix, right? In comparison, but you got to realize that was a part of their path and their journey, and Publix is a part of yours. All right? Now, we don't get sponsorships, so maybe they went to Kroger. I don't know, or Aldi or whatever. Right? But the point is, as you go, be open to the Holy Spirit changing and directing your paths to using you to impact people. Even for my young people when you're in school, expect God to use you even there because we are supposed to be light, right? And you know the, the, the greatest impact light has is not around other light but in the midst of darkness. So as we go, you expect it, and he'll show you what to do. Amen? If you're here today and you have never made Jesus Lord of your life, uh, now I get to ask you one of the most important questions you'll ever consider. Um, every single one of us is going to die one day. This is just one of those things. And the reality is what we believe and what Jesus has told us is that there is when you die, you'll go to heaven or you'll go to hell. And the way that you get there is not all the goody-goody things that you do by receiving the sacrifice that he made for every single person on this earth. He died. And what we believe is he walked this earth, he lived, he died on this cross to pay the penalty for our sins. In his death, and then he was buried for three days, and then he rose again. Uh, in Acts, we saw at the beginning of chapter 1, he was here for 40 days before he ascended up to heaven, and it's going to come back. What he says is, you believe in me, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and you're saved. And that seals your future once you die. By believing in that death, burial, and resurrection, it seals it. And so can you say without any doubts that, hey, if I were to die in the next few moments, I know I'm going to be in heaven. Because it is as simple as making a decision to believe in him. But also in that decision, it's not like, okay, well, let me just get insurance, life insurance in case I die. But what we're agreeing to is to make him Lord of our life, and we're going to serve him. And we're going to be his witnesses in this earth so that other people can be saved. But it starts with you making that decision for yourself. This is not one of those things that you leave up to chance. This is not one of those things that you're like, well, I think so. You have to know that you know. And so I love you enough to tell you the truth. And so that if you need to make that decision today, please, ma'am, please, sir, in a moment, our prayer counselors are going to come down. We're going to sing and all of that stuff. Don't leave this place without being sure, without being certain. When I ask the question, it's not about church. It's not about religion. It's about you having a relationship with not only the one who knows you better than you know yourself, but the one who created you, who loved you, who died for you, but also has tasks and assignments for you to complete while you're living between now and the time that you go to heaven. And so... If you need to make that decision, this is your moment. When we come down and sing, please uh, come and talk to someone, and let's walk you through that process. Second is the area of rededication. Rededication is for those who say, well, look, Pastor, I made that decision to place my faith in Jesus, so I know I'm going to heaven. But if I'm honest, I know I'm not living the life that I should be living. Maybe there's been loss. There's been trauma. There's been hurt. Uh, maybe there's been bad decisions. Maybe there's been sex. There's been drugs. There's been things that have just gotten you off track. And often what happens is, is when we find ourselves in that place, we feel uh, uh, sometimes walking around in like guilt and condemnation. We find ourselves walking around feeling like, oh, I got to get myself together. Or, man, uh, I can't even talk to God because I need to, I need to change or whatever. And what he says is, look, 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 no, no, no. He asks us to repent, to turn from that thing and turn back to him. If we could get ourselves together, we wouldn't need him anyway, right? 
And so if that is you and you say, man, you know what, I'd love to uh, recommit and rededicate myself to the things of God. Man, now is an appropriate time to be able to do that. Don't spend another moment living a defeated life or feeling like I can't do what God called me to do because of this. Because here's the good news. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for all of our sins, past, present, and future. Which sounds weird, right? But you think about it. All of our sins were in the future when he died on the cross. Hebrews says it was a one-time sacrifice for all, forever. And so having an understanding of that doesn't mean like, oh, well, since he died for all of them, party. No. <laughs> what it means is that since he died for those sins, we don't have to feel like, oh, man, I can't go forward and I can't come back to God. It's a never-failing, undying love that he has for us. And he expects us to do the things that he's called us to do. And so if that's you and you're like, man, I want to re rededicate, recommit myself to the things of God, when the prayer counselors are down here, we would love to walk you through that process. Thirdly is prayer. If you need prayer for anything, there's nothing too big, there's nothing too small. We are a church that knows prayer works. And we count it a privilege to be able to pray with and for you. And so if you need prayer for anything, when we come down and while we're singing, please come and allow us to pray with you and pray for you. And finally, if God's called you to be a part of this church, here's what you need to know. Uh, no matter who's up here on a Sunday, Wednesday, but whatever we do, one of our goals is to teach the Word of God in a simple and an uncomplicated way so you can understand it and go live it. In addition, uh, uh, we try and to make a difference in the community, right? You think about what VBS is, it's not just for us, it's obviously for those uh, in our community who are going to come by here, right? Because we feel like that's what the Bible teaches us, we have to do that. Thirdly, we are a church uh, that are made up of people from different backgrounds, different age groups, different walks of life, different origin stories. And what it looks like is, as we're pursuing Jesus, we've come to bring our gifts and talents together to be used in this place and beyond these walls to make a difference for the kingdom. And if you say, man, I love to be a part of that, well, we would love to have you. So there's four things. If you, need to, if you need to get saved, if you need to rededicate, if you need prayer, or if God's calling you to be a part of this church, uh, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor right now. Can you stand for a moment right where you are, if you're able to stand? And as my prayer counselors, could y'all come down and get in position? And as they come and get in position, uh, please respond to one of those things if it's your turn to respond. Thank you.